Jason, uh, appreciate you having me and good morning to everyone. It's great to see so many familiar names and and faces. <clears throat> Chip and I were in Cody last uh, on um, on Monday for, for Cody days. That was one of the first um, face to face meetings we've had with the public uh, in over a year. I think we can all agree this last 12 to 14 months has been especially challenging. <clears throat> Um, you know, I want to say thanks to all of you for the tremendous assistance that you've given both of these parks uh, through COVID. I think if you think about a rewind 12 months ago to the conversations that we were having right now last year, there was really so much uncertainty, um, a lot of questions about how the year was going to progress. Uh, you know, I think Jonathan's charts are, are telling. Uh, it was a successful year overall. Uh, we had many, many challenges to deal with, but I credit the teams in these parks and uh, the partners and many of the partners teams, obviously, in um, helping us navigate last year. So, you know, last year we were obviously closed for two months. Um, you know, our, I think our, our May, we opened the two Wyoming gates the end of the last two weeks of May and we had 22% normal visitation. Um, we got criticized substantially for that, by the way, even 22% during a pandemic, many people felt was too many uh, 12 months ago. Uh, June was about 50% of normal. Uh, July was about even. End of July started to really take off and August was the second busiest. September was the busiest on record and October was the busiest on record. Fast forward to now, uh, you know, I think a lot of positives have happened between last fall and Today, we've got 1,000 uh, employees vaccinated. Uh, the state and the governor has been incredibly supportive in giving uh, vaccinations to Teton County and Park County, Wyoming, uh, to allow these parks to get their seasonal workforces uh, vaccinated. So we have several thousand more vaccines ready to go for our seasonal employees. That's very important. And it's going to be needed because uh, we just got April's numbers here for Yellowstone, busiest on record. Um, you're the first people to, to learn about that, but and we'll get those numbers out. Our opening day last weekend um, was about an 88% increase over 2019. We didn't, we weren't open this time last year. Um, so we took 2019 and, and the opening day total was 88% over two years ago. Um, and so, I've predicted that this will be a record-breaking visitation year. I think there's a, a couple of factors that drive that. Number one, you know, it's hard to compare it to last year, but I think COVID is, is, has changed and will continue to change the, um, the types of visitors we get, the, the way that they travel. Um, but you know, last year what we had as a closure, no international travel, and we had uh, trepidation around domestic traveling. This year we have no closure, um, still not too much international travel, and we don't have the trepidation that we had around domestic uh, traveling. So I think, and we're already seeing it here, this will be a record year. I don't know what that means exactly. Um, you know, my guess, I, I threw out there 4.5 to 4.7 to the press the other day. That's a complete just guess. We sat around 4 million for the last five years. Uh, I want to remind everyone in the uh, Park Service, uh, leading up to the centennial in 2016, we launched a multi-million dollar global marketing campaign to advertise and market U.S. national parks uh, globally. And we grew our visitation in a five-year period from about 280 million in the system to about 330 million. And so we told people to find their parks and guess what, they did. And when I came into this job in 2018, uh, Yellowstone, uh, because of largely the Find Your Park campaign, had about a million more people per year uh, visiting the park. That's a lot. And uh, it requires us to have these types of conversations moving forward as visitation continues to grow and, and will likely continue to grow about what types of actions are we all comfortable taking, obviously to accomplish the mission objectives that Jonathan just pointed out, conservation being predominant, um, but also to thread the needle with using the right information, the right data, the right science to drive the decision making and do it in a way that's defensible and not like sometimes the government is, which is 
unexplainable or indefensible actions that are taking that people just learn about by surprise. This is something that we need to continue to build together and understand what are true impacts versus what is maybe a hyperbolic uh, to some degree. I think people need to be careful not to conflate traffic jams with resource impacts. Um, we had one of our, we had a, a two hour bison jam um, yesterday. There's not that many people in the park, honestly. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that here more in a second, but you know, I think that people need to understand that just a, a picture of, of traffic uh, looking at a grizzly does not necessarily equate overcrowding. It can, but uh, that's regularly, I think, overused and, and a, a bit hyperbolized. Uh, when I came in, in in October of 2018, there had been a narrative around a visitation cap and a reservation system in Yellowstone. Um, what I found is a, a great, a tremendous amount of work had been done prior to my arrival in visitor use management, but we really did not have a structured or strategic approach to uh, a, what are we trying to accomplish? What objectives are, try, are we trying to meet? Uh, and B, how are we going to do that? And, and then last, is a visitation cap or a reservation system the right path to follow right now? Um, and so what we've done here is structured a strategy around kind of four kind of emphasis areas. One, what are the actual impacts of increasing visitation on the resources of this park? And that's a that's fundamentally um, the most important are, uh, of, of the four I'm about to mention. Do we have the right data? Where are resource impacts occurring? Um, what actions have we taken to mitigate or prevent those impacts? Those are all very important questions to answer. And I'll talk a little bit about it. The second area is what are the impacts on staffing operations and infrastructure? Uh, the problem last year, we got close to 4 million, which is normal, but we had a lot less staff because of COVID housing requirements. And so, you know, when you look at managing people, you have to have people to manage people. So that means you need money. That means you need flexibility. That means you need to be able to do different things in different parts of the park. It's not a one size fits all, but understanding what the staffing impacts of a million more people per year in this park on the facilities, on the roads, on the infrastructure, a million more people flushing toilets, you know, things, things people don't think about. What's a million more people flushing toilets per year due to the wastewater treatment facilities? you know, things like that. So that's number two. Three is what are the impacts on visitor experience? And my predecessor did a fantastic job getting a lot of really high quality, the best quality visitor survey data in the system. Uh, and we, we listened and we've heard from a thousands and thousands and thousands of people about what their viewpoints are and largely very, very positive. We've got very specific areas where it's not so positive and that's a good place to start the conversation. I'll talk more about that in a second. The last is what are the impacts on the gateways? And this is where I really appreciate this, this dialogue with all of you as partners is um, have no illusion, there's no shortage of divergent opinions about this issue in gateway communities around Yellowstone. Um, and, you know, Ann and I talk on a regular basis. I mean, Chip and I talk weekly, Trisha and I talk. I mean, there is um, some commonalities, no question, but there are major different differences between Jackson, Cody, Cook City, Gardner, and West Yellowstone. So where are those common threads amongst those communities? Um, how do we engage those communities properly to understand not just the economics? We know that economic impacts are of utmost importance. We saw that clearly last year. But what do we need to do in the park to work through a strategy? And I use this example. So if this hand is the left side of the spectrum at me and we're not doing anything, and this hand is we're capping visitation in Yellowstone, you know, what have we done on that scale or in that spectrum uh, to address increasing visitation impacts in those four areas that I identified? And so for our top four areas of priority right now that we're monitoring are and have a substantial amount of data on resource impacts on impacts to staff and infrastructure, on visitor experience are in this order. One, Midway Geyser Basin, two is Norris, three is Canyon, and four is Mammoth. Um, Old Faithful's in there, but actually Old Faithful has so much uh, 
infrastructure that it's crowded, uh, but it, it, it's generally manageable. The other areas I just mentioned are, are literally being overrun uh, and we, we are seeing these in those areas and things have to be done. Uh, we haven't done an this yet, but we are going to re reconfigure Midwinter Basin. Uh, we'll probably do some type of time then in, in a particular location. We're gonna look at doing something similar at Norris. We're doing the electric vehicle driverless shuttles at Canyon. We're gonna test that technology uh, we're doing a shuttle feasibility study at Old Faithful for the Old Faithful corridor. Uh, so there are very specific things that we're going to do in these areas that we've recognized and identified as being the highest priorities. And, and then we can, we can kind of see how that works and grow that from there. Um, it can't be a light switch, but, you know, if we see 4.5 million to 5 million visitors this year, uh, we're going to need to have a different conversation perhaps. Uh, than we have in the past. And what we want to have is a good foundation of information, of data to share, of um, dialogue like this, so we can listen to people, uh, understand what people's viewpoints are, and then come up with something that makes sense, whatever that is on that spectrum in those different areas. What Chip and I have agreed to, and Chip worked together for a very long time, we're very lucky to have Chip as a superintendent of Grand Teton, uh, is that it's essential uh, that to the best degree possible, Grand Teton and Yellowstone are on the same page. You know, there's nothing more frustrating to visitors. The visitors to Yellowstone are, are the visitors to Grand Teton and vice versa. Nothing more frustrating than having, you know, two different parks in close proximity with, you know, different rules and, and those types of things. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see my, my good friend down there and uh, uh, Grand Teton is very lucky to have him and you as a community. Um, I'll touch on a couple things and I'll, I'll pass it over. I know I only have 10 or 15 minutes, Jonathan, but uh, then we can do the Q&A. Um, you know, the conflict between enjoyment and conservation, if you want to call it a conflict, I mean, those are both corridor mission, presence predominant, conservation is predominant. Uh, we cannot... Uh, all of our actions have to be geared towards keeping this park in as good a condition or better uh, for the enjoyment of future generations. I did 208 miles in the back country of Yellowstone last year. Uh, once I got a mile off the road and I, I, I purposefully counted the number of people that I saw uh, and I saw nine and 208 miles. Uh, now, the vast majority of this park, trust me, does not see a visitor. The road corridor makes up 1% of this park. I'm not dismissing the resources in the road corridor. I'm not writing them off. Um, but I think it's important that people understand that the 6% the of the park that's developed areas, the 1% of the park that's the road corridor, um, you know, we are focused on resource impacts in those areas, those high visitation areas. Um, but this ecosystem is stronger than it, than it ever has been. Is it under threat from climate change? Yes, and we can have a whole separate conversation about that. Is there a potential as increasing visitation occurs for there to be major issues? Absolutely. Uh, but the reality is, if you think about it, 100 years ago, even with National Park Protection, we killed every predator in this park, almost. We killed all the wolves, we killed almost all the grizzlies, all the cougars, we decimated the bison herds. We were feeding grizzlies out of our hands 50 years ago at garbage dumps. And we slowly, because of the teams and the partnerships and the value we put on this, this incredible place, put the pieces back together, that ecosystem. It's by no means where it needs to be. And we can't be complacent. Well, let's not, we cannot act like going to 4 million visitors per year <clears throat> is crashing the ecosystem. It's not. Uh, so let's do this strategically together. Let's try to get on the same page with what our goals and objectives are. Let's be willing to <clears throat> try things out together, uh, keep the dialogue going and understand each other's perspectives. And that's what we're focused on here.